Good evening and welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're so pleased to welcome Stephen Leggett in support of All Things in Motion and in conversation this evening with Keith Taylor. Just a quick webinar overview for those of you who are joining us. The chat is closed to you this evening, but you can keep that chat window open as I will be sharing links to purchase the collection from Literati throughout the event. Live transcription is available on your toolbar as well. And if you're watching us later on YouTube, there are links to purchase books directly below me in the description. And you can also subscribe to be kept up to date with all of our events once they become available on our channel. And as a reminder, you or if you're watching live, you can use the Q&A to submit any questions at any time. Uh, I will read a selection at the conclusion of the reading and conversation. And as a reminder, you can shop for more books, literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. But of course, if you live in Southeast Michigan or right in Ann Arbor, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. Most of all, we'd just like to thank you for your attendance this evening uh, or this morning or this afternoon uh, or much later in the evening, depending on when and where you may be joining us from. But without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's author and our interlocutor. Stephen Leggett grew up in Manistee on the shores of Lake Michigan a region with a geography of snow, wind, and waves that has continually informed his writing. After earning a degree in anthropology and literature, he returned to his landscape in northern Michigan, living for many years in a remote cabin in the Udall Hills region of the Manistee National Forest. When he moved to southeast Michigan, he worked in bookshops, music stores, and then for many years as a music reviewer. He's published several chapbooks of poetry, including The All Forest, The Form It Takes, and Entropy in the New World. His poems have appeared in The Nation, Louisville Review, Passages North, and many other magazines and journals. Also, a songwriter and musician, he's released six albums with his band, The Buzz Rats, the most recent being Bright Shiny Life in 2011. Joining him after a reading, Keith Taylor has published many books over the years, collections of poetry, a collection of very short stories, co-edited volumes of essays and fiction, and a volume of poetry translated from modern Greek. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Leggett and Keith Taylor into your living rooms. Thanks, John. I don't know if I was supposed to do an introduction, but I think your introduction covered all the bases. I will come back um, when Steve decides he's read long enough and uh, ask a couple of questions and, uh, uh, but, and then try to get out of the way so your questions, if you have them, can get to him through John. So, uh, you know, most important man of the evening. Stephen Leggett, go for it, Legs. Thanks, John. Thanks, Keith. Um, a little disclaimer at the start of this. I've somehow gotten through two years of this pandemic, having never done a Zoom anything. So this is my inaugural, whatever you call it, Zoom voyage. Um, I got tons of advice, all of which boil down to wear pants. So. Um, this little book, I'm so proud of it, just the way it feels, just to hold it. It's a beautiful little object. Um, it goes, it starts in winter and goes to spring, and that's sort of the through line of it. But it also starts with solitude and poverty um, and moves through to the end, to connection, human connection. Um, those of you who know me well know that I'm not much of a financial wizard. Um, so the first three poems in this book really are about sparseness, poverty, the lack of something. So happy to have a coat with pockets. This poem, I don't think I've ever had a poem come together quicker. I actually spent a year homeless. Um, I just didn't prepare for retirement. And when it came, it was like falling off a cliff. Uh, and it took me about a year to get my affairs together. I never lacked for a place to sleep. I have lots of friends. Um, so, but I started to be really grateful for little things like a coat with pockets on the first really cold night of fall. So happy to have a coat with pockets. In deep winter, it is said geese in flight become the wild hunt, harvesting souls, honking and clattering across the moon, a ragged orchestra 
chasing down time, wailing at it, as only departing things can. As, as John mentioned in that introduction, I spent many years living in a cabin in the Udell Hills region of the Manistee National Forest. Um, and the last winter I spent there before I moved to Ann Arbor was this horrendous winter, like eight, nine inches of snow every day, big winds. And I'm essentially snowbound in the cabin, miles a long hike out to anything like a paved road. And I was feeling pretty sorry for myself. My marriage had kind of fallen apart. My two-year-old son was south in the state. I didn't know how that was going to work out. It did. You know, it did. We worked together and raised that boy. Um, but I was feeling pretty sorry for myself. And I didn't have a penny to my name. On poverty. The windows burn in silence, three lamps, not a track, not a glimmer. And now it won't stop snowing. To sit here like this while the world fills with snow is to know finally that each loss is a loss. I take comfort in the fact that under the eaves this morning, three finches took shelter like three kings. This one's called Making Angels. We've all done it. We fall back in the snow and make angels. And it's easy like this, making angels in the snow. The rest of the world can wait. Our troubles can wait. Maybe it's just that easy. Fall back into the gentle snow, make a thousand angels, gaze up at the heavens, be on our way. Why are you crying? This next one is called uh, Seven Winter Poems. Uh, but when I wrote it, I always thought of it as one poem in seven sections. And I thought, when I finish it, I'll go back and I'll change the title to something. Well, I never did that. I just got used to it being seven winter poems. So when it came time to do this little book, my editor at Alice Green and Company, Jill Peak, said we should do each of the sections individually on a page. So it went from being one poem in my mind to seven poems, but then I called it seven winter poems. So there you are. It's a chimera, I guess. Seven Winter Poems. It starts with a quote from Wallace Stevens from the famous snowman poem, One Must Have a Mind of Winter. And when I started this poem, that was my thought. I'm just going to try to get to the bottom of what is winter, because I'm sitting in the middle of it in this cabin. One must have a mind of winter. The swirling browns, grays, and rusts of its plumage its placement, shape, and texture, its soft white feathering, the rough grouse or what the fox left of it in the fresh snow forms the exact configuration of the northern forest in November. Always the exact form startles me. The way suddenly the thing at hand will take its place in the world. I watched a flying squirrel launch itself across the cold night sky, tilting and wobbling just slightly, then fold up against a tree trunk some 60 feet away, the sharp click of its claws on arrival, dice-like and clear, and so visibly moved on a winter's night. The snow lice gather at the base of an oak on a bright winter's day, biological haiku, in a microclimate that will end when the sun goes behind a cloud, when the glacial winds take up the cold again, swirling and sweeping the snow back in, erasing everything in the known world, that temporary extinguishable coal. 
A weasel in white flashes down a tree limb, the whole frame a blur, led by a black coal, its eye, and trailed by a black coal, its tail, with everything else in uncertainty, as if the beginning and ending were joined, not by body, but by the shadowy outline of complete combustion. The snowshoe hare circles back on its own trail, as if the ending of it is destined to be somewhere near the beginning of it, and the local population rises and falls from one and none to countless per thicket to near zero, each hare returning on its own snowy path, seeking solace and comfort, if only for having lived a good round life. The nervous trail of a hunting shrew its tracks skittering off like the dendrite branching of frost on a window pane, a scattering of slants and shifts on glass, a sketching of motion, and come morning, the snow begin filling the forest with diamonds. And the crows fly out on Christmas day over the cornfields of the new world, dozens of crows quarreling forth over the thin snow of the cornrows, and back over the steeples of the churches in town where the bells of Christmas ring down, and we drive south beneath them, bells, harsh cries from heaven, broken woodlands. So that was one poem, or seven poems, depending. About those flying squirrels, um, they're cute. Oh, they're so cute with the big round eyes and they're horrible. They're North America's only communal squirrel and they're nocturnal and they decided to make the cabin their home. They were in the ceiling up in the roof and making noises all night long. I ended up hating these two little buggers. Anyway, so you know. They look cute, they're little bastards. That's right. Um, this is that transitional poem in, it, in the book. It's called Walking in an Abandoned Orchard in Late Winter. The first part of this poem I wrote, the first half of it, I wrote like 35 years ago. Um, I was living then in a, a apartment complex that was kind of the first development along this road. And uh, I used to take a walk every day, about a 40, 45 minute walk south from the complex through a remnant woods. And they're all through Washtenaw County, these corridors of undeveloped sort of natural areas. Uh, that the animals use as a corridor to move. Um, it was maybe two football fields in size. And, you know, I'd walk through this little woods, uh, then up this little grade where there was an old railroad track. And then down the other side was an abandoned apple orchard. And on the back of that was this long open field that led to civilization in the main drag. And I'd walk it every day. Uh, there had been a big snowfall and then an immediate thaw, which is the way it is in Michigan a lot of times. Uh, and the thawing had started so that you could start to see what was under the different layers of snow. I'm walking and I see this spot up ahead that's just blood red. And I thought an owl, a hawk or something has made a kill there. Uh, and, you know, essentially it looked like a heart. And as I got closer, uh, I realized it wasn't, it was an old apple that had been torn apart in the snow and the thawing had revealed it. Uh, but I was never happy with what I wrote. And I just stuck it in my files and I went back to it uh, now and then, but I could never really bring it home. Flash forward. 30 some years and by circumstance, I'm back in the same complex 
Only now I'm watching my three-year-old grandson and we take a walk every day in the same area. Except now the remnant woods is maybe 40 yards across and maybe the length of a couple buses. We'd walk through it. The grade where the tr railroad track was, gone. Apple orchard, gone. The pond that was back there, gone. The field, gone. The field was now the parking lot, the back end parking lot of a big strip mall, which had a dollar store in it. So my grandson and I, we'd hike out. We'd go to the dollar store because I could get him a little matchbox car or something. And well, one time he wanted this little bird that made it, that started chirping when you came near it. It had a little sensor. And that became the back end of this poem that I finished some 30, some years after I started it. Walking in an abandoned orchard in late winter. I took the familiar path here up the trail to the rail bed, then across it and down into the ground fog of the orchard where flocks of sparrows shoaled in the winter weeds. In the falling snow, I saw what I thought was a heart, but coming closer, I saw it was not a heart at all, only an apple having fallen so lately in the snow, staining it red. And now, years later, Walking with my grandson, it's a parking lot with a dollar store. And we go in and walk out with a gray bird with a sensor that makes it sing its song when we draw near. And now this turns into show and tell because here is that exact little gray bird. There it is. Uh, it's gone mute. It hasn't chirped or sang or spoken in a couple of years, but this is it. There's a turn, I mean, I love chat books because the way poems can fall together in little sequences that in a longer book, especially since my poems are so short, uh, uh, a longer book, I think those connections just get diffused. This is the poem where this book turns from a solitary feel, a winter feel, and starts to turn to spring. Uh, and it's for my brother, Tom. Um, he's a couple of years younger than me. We, we spent our childhood together, roaming the dunes, roaming the woods, following the rivers, always outside, always interested in what was flying over us. Um, and my brother is, simply the best murderer I know, um, bar none. And, uh, I, you know, I enjoy getting out and, and seeing birds and all of that. And my tip for how to do it is go out with someone who knows what they're doing. Well, he, he was living at in, in Indiana for a time, and we had been talking about me coming down there for a visit. And uh, he said, good, when you come, uh, we'll go see the Sandhill Cranes. Um, so some weeks later, I went down to Indiana and late in the afternoon one day, Tom said, yeah, well, we, we gotta go. And we drove maybe 40 minutes, I don't know, 45 minutes and parked the car. And there were the cranes coming in at, death, at dusk into this marsh. Um, now, Sandhills, are relatively common now. There's tons of them in Washtenaw County, but back then eh, there weren't so many of them around. They really depend on uh, wetlands, marshy areas, and as things get developed, their habitat gets removed and it's tough on them. Cranes are, uh, and their relatives, the limpkins, the rails, the coots, are the oldest surviving lineage of birds. Um, the modern prototype for the crane emerged in the Eocene like 3 million years ago. So they're really the closest we have to dinosaurs flying around these days. And, and cranes are amazing. There are 15 species in the world, um, but no bird flies higher 
the Eurasian crane, when it passes over the Himalayas in migration, is flying at three miles up. No other creature can do that. Um, there's us when we rattle around in our garbage cans and stuff, but no other creature on earth flies that high. Anyway, all of that for a very short poem, a confluence of cranes for Tom. The cranes are entering the marsh at dusk, landing in swirls, in pairs, in threes, in countless patterns, stiff, graceful glides landing just so where weeks ago we planned to be. This is called Moths at the Window. This is another poem that I worked on forever. Uh, at the cabin, we had a big picture window in the front of the cabin and our table was right under the window. So that's where we ate, or if we were gonna read at night or do anything, that's where we did it with an oil lamp sitting in the window. And on late summer nights, early fall nights, if the nights were moonless, that window would just be covered with every kind of moth you could imagine, every kind of night flying insect just fluttering across this big window. And it was like a, kaleidoscope of shapes and forms. And I tried to write this poem forever. Finally, the, finally, moss at the window. And they flutter in like watery ghosts. Pirate ships run ashore on a moonless night. A dozen species, fractals of color, puzzle pieces drawn to the harbor. I can remember sitting on my grandfather's porch, watching moths flutter in some 60 years ago. Jack-o'-lanterns, blurred watermarks, the elegant Luna buffering the glass, the simple gray ones whose wings open to white. We used to call them flickers when my dad was alive. And here's the underling moth clinging to the glass always facing downward as if the world had spun. I had been reading, uh, I don't know, it was before the pandemic. That's how we mark time now it was BP, before the pandemic. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould's book, Wonderful Life. Um, I think it's his best book. Um, I love it. It's about the explosion of life in the pre-Cambrian, Cambrian era. Uh, and I, I, I started thinking about, at one point, our ancestor was one little teeny tiny cell with some sort of control over its movement. And that's where it all started, for a little wheel. Before anything else, before anything at all, it glowed like that, a star, a beautiful, anxious speck of a star, the first uncertain move in the great game of go, nervous, unsteady, exhaustible, and yes, beautiful, resting just now, almost still, it dreams of going. See how it trembles in the outward spokes. This is called Seeing Tigers. And uh, one night with my younger son, who was, I don't know, pretty young, we were walking uh, at night, and the kind of night where the moon white was just really making these really cool shadows with everything. And he kept seeing tigers. And I kept saying, uh uh. Don't worry. And he would take my arm and pretend to shake and be scared. Um, seeing tigers. With the moon half full and bright, 
the shafts of light, thin, flickering. My young son sees tigers. He sees tigers everywhere. And tired of saying there are no tigers, I finally see them too. It's not so hard to see the world again. We're counting tigers as the tigers slip like smiles through the bamboo. And this is where spring arrives in this little book. Uh, it, this is a poem from my other son, my older son. Visiting a greenhouse in Lent. I wish we could travel like this forever, father and son. Down the aisles of greening stalks, into the mesh of risen lilies, the easement of sun and stars, the arc of waters humming, everything evolved, exact, floating in suspension, in you, oh hope against hope, running in your joy along the beds of awakened lilies, tenderness, tenderness, our spring has come. This is called A Quiet Evening, and it is the last poem in the book, and it's really about the full arrival of everything green and no longer winter. Um, a Quiet Evening. A quiet evening with my grandson, so delighted when a Katie did arrives at the window screen. We hear it call out, a shrill, rasping cricket rattle the scrape of a song, green as a fresh leaf. So that's it. That's what I plan to read. <laughs> um, Thanks, Steve. This is this is how we applaud now. And uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, good reading, man. Good reading. That's fun. All right. Thank you. I whatever. I mean, it's it's hard to gauge. You know, I really. Can't see anybody out there, and I miss you. I really do. <laughs> so, I was thinking while you were reading, um, I've done this a few times for Luterati, and maybe it's easier if it's someone I don't know so well. Um, Probably, yeah. You know, the book, the book is fresh, and I don't know anything that's in their mind. Um, you maybe I know too much about. You know, I mean, what do people want to know who haven't known you for fifty friggin' years? You know, um, it's. Uh, there must be something there. Well, I, you know, you brought up a few times that, um, you know, some of these parts of these poems were 30, 35 years old. And I think some of them might be even um, older than that. Uh, I, I, you know, what, what is your process of composition? When, how much do you write when you sit down to these little short poems, maybe even shorter in previous incarnations? Um, what do they do to you? How do you keep going? Um, well, they're when I said they're usually longer, and huh. and and I, you know, I don't want any word in there that isn't pulling its weight, and so they get smaller the more I work on them. So it's just the little kernel of what the poem's got to be. I I write in manic bursts. I might write furiously for two or three weeks straight and it's actually bad for my health because I'll stay up all night and then one day it just goes away then I spend several months looking over everything I wrote uh, and seeing what's there and you know working with it and that's when the poems really start to come I mean I, I when I start them I know what I'm trying to do but the real actual finished poem emerges much later like kind of you know out of a cocoon or something um and i have i keep files of what i all of these manic writing periods uh and i'll go back and look at those files and sometimes i bring them forward and finish a poem that i actually started decades ago so interestingly enough though this little book the first poem, so happy to have a uh, coat with pockets, and the last poem, Quiet Evening, both of those poems, if, 
begins and ends with poems that just came out like that, that were written in the time it takes to read them. That's rare. I love it when it happens, but it is very rare. So. Um, that, that sends me lots of other questions too, but, but, uh, but maybe we should go. So when you put together a chat book, um, so you got a lot of poems. You got you got hundreds of poems out there, and you're putting together a chapbook that has 15, 17, maybe 20 poems in it. Um, how does that happen? Where where does that how does that find its form? And this book really does feel as if it has a form. Well, uh, well, you start out. I mean, here's the thing: every writer, every poet, every musician, singer, they all think they know what they're doing better than anyone else. I mean, you know your own work best. No one else can know it better. Well, that's not true. Um, and putting this book together, the original manuscript that I sent to Alice Green and company uh, was much longer, had a different title. It had the gist of this book in it, but uh, my the Jill P., turned out to be the exact right editor for me because she kept talking about wanting to see the through line, the, the line that ran through the poems that we were gonna have in this little book. And she tossed out the title poem pretty quick. <laughs> it broke my heart. Uh, but but uh, I she dove so deep into this little book that I began to see that through line that she was looking for. And so a lot of that is due to having a really good editor this time. And those of you who know me probably wouldn't have put any bets on me going along with it, but I really think she helped me find the book that was in that original manuscript. And I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of it. And I am really grateful for the deep dive she took into these things. Great, great. Um, I'm also, this is sort of along the same lines, but you know, sometimes we think that uh, young poets these days have uh, very constrained ideas of what the life of a poet could be or should be, um, where your life would not fit the pattern that most of them think or want to, to live. Um, so how do you think the, the, the pattern of your life, the, the, the moments of, of being pretty poor? Um, pretty poor. <laughs> uh, yeah, really poor. Um, how do you think all of that has shaped you? And, and maybe more importantly, how did you manage to keep writing? Is that just a gift or, or was that an effort? How did you manage to keep going in all that time? Uh, um... Well, I kept writing because it's what I do. It's, you know, it's a, I don't know, it's like an illness. <laughs> it's like a long haul writer maybe, but, uh, you know, I've always written. I've written since I was a little kid and it's just what I do. Um, and at some point I felt, this is just me. Uh, I opted not to go the MFA route. I've never had a creative writing class. That doesn't mean I don't know what's going on out there. I, I kind of don't, but um, I, I had mentors. I had writers that I sat at the feet of and listened to and borrowed books from and all of that, but I never took creative writing class. Uh, as a result, I don't, have, I don't have that network of other young writers that I kind of learned with. Um, and so I have always been on the edge of what's been going on with poetry, I think. I, I forgot what the question was, Keith. <laughs> uh, how did you find a way to keep going at all this? Oh, you no, know, I mean, I, yeah. you've been a long time without much of an audience. You know, you, audiences come little blips here and there in your life, but yeah. you went through some, some long periods where you didn't. I, I, I deliberately chose a sort of bohemian life. I took jobs based on whether or not they interested me rather than whether or not they financially rewarded me. All of that came home to roost when it was time to retire. Um, but, you know, I don't have any regrets from it. 
I don't, uh, you know, um, and, and then there's the other thing I do, which is I, I play music. And when I was a single father with little kids, uh, there wasn't time to do both. There just wasn't time. And so for several years, uh, I concentrated on the, on the music, but I still was writing poems. I just wasn't sending them out. I just sat on them. Um, but I've always written. It's, there's always a moment, even if it's your lunch break, you can jot something down on a napkin and work on it later when you get home at night. I mean, it's, if you're going to write, you're going to write. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You're going to do it. Um, that took me another direction. You and I have talked a bunch over the years about the difference between writing songs and writing poems. Maybe you could say something wise and meaningful about that. What's the difference between... I don't know, I don't know about wise and meaningful, but there is a difference. Uh, the difference between a cow and a horse, they have more similarities than they do differences, but the differences are pretty key. Apples and oranges, they're different, but they're similar too. Uh, for me, poetry, uh, it's a solitary activity. It's a meditative one. It's a philosophical one. The writing songs, and I have a band, so we work on those songs, is more of a collective thing. It's more of a social thing. Uh, other people are involved. Um, and I've thought a lot about this. Because to me, they're very separate. They're, they're very different. Um, but I realized the poetry comes out of aloneness. The music isn't me being alone. It's me making a louder noise. Um, and I need both. And, it's to, and now that I'm retired, I have time to do both. I didn't before. I have to choose where my hours went. Um, um, I, I always did both, but, um, and during the pandemic, when it's tough to get together with my band, and it's been really tough to do that, uh, I've turned more to poetry because I don't need anyone else to do it. Um, but I need both in my life. It took me a lot of years to realize they were equal components. I used to always favor one over the other. Now, music made me more money, so there's that. Oh, well, not a lot. lot, not enough to, <laughs> but. I see that uh, John's got some questions there. Um, John, you want to, any of those you want to ask? Absolutely. Um, we'll just go, we'll just go in order. And Keith, feel free to chime in and ask follow-ups as well. And thank you to those of you who submitted your questions um, and, and you can feel free to submit more. Uh, Julia writes, you shared your experience of homelessness and experience of intensity and being, quote, on the edge. Do you think that poets and poetry inevitably seek out intensity and or life experiences that occur on the edge? I, I mean, maybe there are writers who seek them out. Uh, I don't. I mean, I don't want to be on the edge. Um, I think life just brings us those precipices, you know, they just take us to the edge sometimes. Uh, in the case of the year I spent homeless, I don't want to give a false impression of this. I didn't have a home. Uh, everything I had was in storage. I was living out of a backpack, but I never lacked for a couch to sleep on. I had lots of friends. I wasn't, you know, I was simply saving the social security checks until I had enough to get my own place again, which I did. And, you know, but yeah, I felt sorry for myself a few times. Um, you know, but I was in that situation because the choices I made, I didn't work jobs that were going to give me an S day. So, and as a single dad, if I'd had an S day, I would have used it anyway. So, thank you. So, no, don't seek out <laughs> strange, crazy edges. They'll, you'll get enough of those without even looking for them. Um, Diane and Dean asked, how would you describe the through line of the book? Uh, well, the obvious one is it goes from winter to spring. Um, and it also goes from, like I said earlier, from 
solitude to connection. Um, and the original manuscript had a lot of asides. And, 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 and this was where Jill helped me see what needed to come out to make that through line really work. And I, I'm very grateful. There must be only one Diana Dean we know. So, hey, you guys. Yeah. Hey, guys. Yeah. Who uh, lived at the, the cabin after I moved to Ann Arbor? Yeah. So, um, they have a follow up question. You say you've been drawn to writing poetry since you were a kid. Where did that come from? No, not, not poetry since I was a kid. Drawn to mm. writing. Uh, you know, uh, poetry. I actually wrote songs before I wrote poetry. And then one day, you know, I decided to type out the song lyrics and I was immediately hit by, geez, where do I break this line? And I started to get intrigued by that. And I was a freshman at Ferris at the time. And I went to their library and I knew enough of the uh, Dewey Decimal System and the Library of Congress system to know where the poetry books were. And I went through the contemporary poetry section, which they had, whoever curated it there did a good job. And I just, I knew nothing about contemporary poetry at all. I'm like 19 years old or something. And, and um, I simply pulled out any book whose title interested me. And I'd look at a couple of pages. Well, here's the books I checked out and went home with just by random. Gary Snyder's The Back Country. I liked that one because it had shit in the first poem, and I didn't know you could do that with bear shit. Uh, Hayden Carruth's North Winter. Wendell Berry's The Broken Ground. And William Stafford's Traveling Through the Dark. Just at random, because I like the titles. What a great set of books to start great with. Books, yeah. So I went home and I started reading these things and I went, wow, there's a whole, I mean, I knew Ezra Pound and Robert Frost, whatever they taught you in high school. And I was always interested in, in, in poetry, but that's where it really started. The songs came first. Thank you. Um, we'll switch to a question from Christine who writes, uh, how is writing your poems different than writing your songs? Again, well, the a most obvious difference is when I write the songs, I've got a guitar or piano or banjo or something. Um, and you're doing it different because poems, at least these days, we can hear them, we can see them, we can get them two different ways. We can get them on the page or like this, where the writer or the poet is reading them. Um, songs are different. They only come to you one way through the years. And um, some words you can't sing. Hmm. So, uh, songs require round words, like the word round or long or day. Uh, distinguished doesn't work so good, that word. Or, you know, uh, obligation. I mean, there's a lot of words that are difficult to sing. So a song, you got to be aware of that, that you're connecting through the ear. Um, and people aren't going to sit well Robertson Jeffers said said it's hard to set fire to too much thought in a song it's really hard to set fire to very much thought you really got to keep it simple you want to create an earworm and so it's different the poetry is much more meditative uh, there's still music in it but it's not I don't have to sing it the same <laughs> way anyway. <laughs> hey, you're getting old now, Lex. Do you think, uh, you know, once the pandemic ends up, do you think you'd be making much more music? I don't expect to. Um, we're working on, and we've been working on it forever, and the pandemic hasn't, hasn't helped uh, our seventh album. And I don't expect to do another one. Um, the other thing, difference between music and poetry is doing music is physical. Really, you know, I mean, you do a gig. Yeah, it's fun, but it you're exhausted afterwards. It's physical. And singing is much more physical than reading a poem. Um, I don't see myself doing that a whole lot longer. 
Um, I could be wrong. I've been wrong lots of times, but uh, once this album's done, I don't know, maybe an occasional gig here or there. Um, for an old man, it's not the right hours to be a musician. <laughs> That's, I'm not. It's, yeah, it's much harder work. Um, I still love it. I'm still proud of what we've done, but I, uh, I, I'm just not going to be able to physically do it much longer. There's some beautiful songs. We sing them in our house. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank some you. that you never even recorded, we sing in our house. <laughs> That's the other thing. I've got files and files of poems. I've also got cassettes and CDs full of song demos. I've got hundreds. Um, but, you know, there's only so much time, I guess. Okay. Uh, there's a question from Faith. Um, for the poems that you started 30 plus years ago and then finished later, did you feel like the same person? Or was it like looking back and wondering who wrote that? No, I, I, I've been pretty consistently the same person for all the way through. Um, uh, what what surprises me about it when that happens is that there can still be a connection between me now and me then. That's the surprise. But yeah, I, I think I've been in my themes and what I'm interested in and what I write, I, I think I've been pretty consistent. So I can take something I wrote 40 years ago and hook it up to something I wrote last night and, and it might work. I mean, I don't, I don't have a different philosophical position or anything. So. Um, thank you. Um, there's a question from Tom. Uh, do you? This is a family affair. You know? <laughs> <laughs> do you think and agree with me that your poems uh, have deep roots to the river rats and big rapids? You, me, Scott, Cat, Tom. Definitely. I mean, my childhood. Uh, my brother and I, Tom, and he's talking about my cousin Scott, who passed a few years ago. But we were brothers. Um, Scott lived, he was like our cousin, but he lived just two or three doors, houses down on this river. And his dad had an old rowboat. We took that thing out on the river all the time and we hiked. Yeah, it definitely did. My brother and I uh, found when we were kids along the land on the side of the road, this green hardcover book, which turned out to be, I think, the second edition of Roger Tory Peterson's Field Guide to the Birds. And we were little kids and we were like, wow, what is this? Um, and my brother Tom, who asked that question, uh, the crane guy, um, it, he, uh, he still has that book and it changed our lives. Uh, he, both of us. Um, and I've been asked, you know, what, what are your influences? Well, I think one of the biggest influences on me are field guides. I collect them. I have hundreds of them, uh, often to places I'll never be. I just, you know, the Galapagos, Costa Rica, uh, Southern Africa, but I love field guides. Uh, and to make room for the photos or the paintings or the uh, range maps and all the things, the prose parts have to be really economical, precise, clear. Uh, and I love that sort of terse exactness of the prose in the field guides. I read them like novels. And uh, so, yeah, Tom, that finding that book and our adventures as kids, into, yeah, the backbone of who I am, really. <laughs> I remember one time you were talking about that old book to me and um, you quoted Peterson on snow buntings and he had the sentence, if I'm remembering it right, um, it's as if snowflakes are rising upwards from the field. Um, and, and that's not been that way in, in later editions of, the, of the, 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 the Peterson Field Guide or any of the others are much more prosaic. But that's because a little- needed more room. Yeah, right. It's true. Yeah. Uh, but that's a lovely image um, to think of snow bunting. Since you're out there right now, this winter up in Washtenaw County, um, 
although Steve and I have gone looking for them and haven't seen them. But you look for the snow, the, the snowflakes rising up out of the field, which is beautiful. Um, a, a viewer writes, uh, your pandemic poem was maybe the most hopeful thing that I read during the pandemic. Did you ever submit it for publication? I did not. Although, if you'd like, I can read it. That would be wonderful, yeah. Um, I, 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 I haven't written much about the pandemic, uh, just a couple things. Um, but this little book, this for all things in motion was put together and assembled during the pandemic. And there is an influence there. I don't know what it is because the pandemic has influenced all of us. There's no doubt. Um, I, I don't, I don't know how to write about it. I mean, my, uh, my subjects tend to be non-human mostly. I, I, I really look at things as a, a, I see the world as landscapes and in the land, like one of those old Chinese paintings, you know, and off in the distance, there's a bird. I mean, that's the way I see the world. Uh, and those processes are going on all the time, whether there's a pandemic or not. So I haven't written about it much. I'm trying to find it. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, I told you Keith called me Sunday night when the lockdown was announced. And uh, I don't know why I'm not finding it. I, I will, promise you. Uh, and like I said, I hadn't been paying attention to this COVID thing. I, to me, it was a distant thing. But then all of a sudden, the lockdown hit. Keith called that Sunday night. And the very next day, um, I really should organize all these things. <laughs> the very next day, I was stunned. I, I live on the fifth floor of a uh, senior uh, HUD subsidized senior high rise. I face due north. And there's usually... I, I, the streets were empty. There was nothing going on. Um, I was stunned. The world changed overnight. I'm trying to find it, guys. I really am. Sorry to waste your time. <laughs> no, please. It. You'll 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 find it. Thank you for your vote of confidence there. <laughs> Unless I put it in my other, no, well, it's got to be in there. Um, but I, I, I immediately wrote this poem uh, about the pandemic called A Pandemic in Spring, and then, then never really went back to the subject again, but several people said, oh, they liked it. So, but, I, and I didn't put it in this For All Things in Motion book, because the thing about a pandemic poem is, I mean, it stops the parade immediately. Uh, you you put it in a book and everything that comes after it and everything that comes before it is kind of defined by it. Um, at least till 50 years have passed and we look back at it in a different way, but um, boy, I'm not finding it. Maybe it's in my other, must be in my other. But, well, we know you've got hundreds of poems lying in different files, so. Oh, and, and here's the other thing, is up until the computer age, I, I lo I've lost more poems than I've written. Uh, Eric Turgeson, teacher and friend of mine, a great poet and, and, and a big influence in my life, uh, has sent me two or three packets of things that I sent him years and years ago. And I get them, and I, I don't remember writing that. I have no <laughs> idea what that is. And once the computer age hit, I, I, you know, I got really good at saving things on flash drives and everything like that. But prior to that, who knows where things are? And then uh, I'll tell. While you're looking, Steve, I'll tell the story. When that cabin, oh. the first iteration of that cabin up in the Manistee National Forest. Oh, right burned down i mean it was uh when i went up i went up from ann arbor to see if i could be of any help which was 
which I really wasn't, but I was there. Oh, you um, were. Trust me. <laughs> but I, when I say burned to the ground was uh, something I'd never really understood. There was an old piano in that place, a wood stove, and there was nothing higher than, than my knees. Um, but Just one of the things steps. I remember finding these charred fragments of paper with a couple little lines of poems on them. Yeah. And this is in the middle of the woods, you know, um, and, uh, and, and, and it was winter, uh, you know, so it was like, Oh, these charred bits of poems blowing through the blowing. <laughs> through the snow. Yeah. My I, when I think back, and I found the poem, by the way, but when yeah. I think back to the cabin, the first incarnation of the cabin, which burned. We rebuilt further back on the land. Um, but the, looking back on it, it reminds me of a giant phoenix nest. Because, I mean, our, after that burned, we had only the clothes on our backs. And uh, it was like a whole new life rose out of that. Not necessarily the life we thought we wanted, but we had to start over. Uh, I've had to start over so many times in my life, and and I each time I've had to start over, I've lost tons of poems that are just gone. I don't know where they are, but it's been better. Like I said, since the computer age, I save stuff now. All right, I've got the poem. Um, a pandemic in spring. The first thing that must go is politics. The streets and shops are empty. The wind throws up swirls of dust and a whole winter's worth of salt and debris is swept away to the sea. Anything too weak to hold on is swept away. A cough in the breezeway is like a gunshot. Love is sent at a distance. The morning doves that visit the balcony each spring are back, bless them both. Their soft calls to each other are sad as ghosts. But the world isn't stopping, it's spring. And even as this ship sails on without a harbor, things are transforming again. The dandelions, my grandson, calls sunflowers because they remind him of the sun, are rising from the lawns like the lions they are. That's a long poem, Legs. For me, that's yeah. that's an epic. You know, for me, that's the cantos. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Um, I think that's a beautiful place to end on as well as it's the top of the hour. Thank you so much for for reading that poem. <laughs> um, and of course, you can you can purchase the collection uh, for all things all things in motion uh, in in the chat there. There's a link. There's also a link if you're watching later on YouTube in the description below me, Steve and Keith. Uh, Hope to have you in the store for an event yes. uh, fairly sure. soon. Um, but I hope you continue to both stay safe and be well. And thanks as always for joining us. And to all of our viewers, thank you for joining us as well. We look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thanks, thank you. Have a great night. Have a great weekend. Yeah. Sure.